Good morning, my name is Elizabeth Moran, I'm from FIG Securities, I'm Director of Education and Fixed Income Research here. Thank you for joining us today for the Fundamentals of Fixed Income webinar. Um, I'd like to say a big hello and welcome to everyone who reads The Australian and um, hopefully a few of you have seen the column that's been running the last few weeks there and uh, you might have some questions for us which we hope we'll be able to answer. Today I'm joined by Jake Conduction who um, is Associate Director of private client services. Jake's had a long history in finance and um, has worked many years overseas in uh, Canada and North America in equities as well as debt and portfolio management. So he's here really to um, talk through some of the specific securities and uh, my background as I think most of you will know is in research and education so I'll tackle most of those questions and uh, look after that part of the presentation. So if you can't see already, um, there should be a, a panel on the right hand side of your screen, there's an orange arrow there. If you can't see the panel, click the orange arrow and you'll see about three quarters of the way down a section called questions. So if you have any questions for us um, through the presentation, please type them in. Some of them we'll answer through the presentation and others we'll leave to the end. And depending on the time, if we don't get to all of the questions today, we'll certainly give you a call or um, email your response. We'll certainly be in contact. So please feel free to ask any questions as we go along. Now just before we start, a little bit about myself. I've been with FIG for about six years now. Uh, my background is in uh, marketing and communication. I was a paid editor for a while, um, but then was offered the opportunity to learn credit and so became a credit analyst. And um, I also worked overseas in London for about five years. I worked with NatWest Markets as a credit rating analyst and um, I also worked with BP Oil uh, and some other banks over there. So uh, most people at FIG like myself have overseas or international experience and um, really we're here, here to help uh, in the fixed income sense and promote the asset class in any way we can. So let's, without further ado, go to the first slide. So a little bit about FIG Securities, uh, we were established 15 years ago uh, by a man called Jim Stenning. Jim uh, worked overseas for Banco Santander amongst other banks in fixed income and recognised that uh, the middle market and uh, smaller investors in Australia really couldn't access uh, bonds and fixed income and that was because the parcels, the minimum parcel size was $500,000 which was just too much for any individual or, or middle market um, investor. So Jim um, came back to Australia with the intention of opening uh, the market to those investors and um, uh, we've been I think quite successful doing that. We about three years ago um, um, introduced our direct bond service, so direct bonds enable a direct purchase from $50,000 or $100,000 uh, per bond uh, and just more recently we've made bonds available in $10,000 parcels, so really hoping to um, open it up essentially the wholesale market, open the wholesale market to individual investors like yourselves. So FIG um, deals with the full range of fixed income um, investments and that includes term deposits and uh, short term money management um, products. So we have a, a term deposit brokerage service that roughly we speak to about 60 authorised deposit taking institutions every day to get their best rates, so we feel we can offer our clients the best term deposit rates. But we also um, are active in the secondary um, wholesale market, active secondary bond traders. So once bonds are first issued, then there's a very active market where um, uh, there's buyers and sellers buying and selling the bonds all the time. So we have about a billion dollars in that secondary uh, bond trading in, in terms of funds under advice and about eight billion in the term deposit business. Now when I joined FIG there was about 15 staff and there's now approximately a hundred um, spread through four offices. So we have an office in Perth, Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane and I'm in Brisbane um, as is the rest of the research team. Uh, and that sort of leads me to the last point on this slide that we do provide specialist fixed income research on any of the um, companies uh, where we trade the bonds. So very important to get 
fixed income, dedicated fixed income research and not rely on the um, share or the equity research because the drivers are different. But I'll talk a bit about that as we, as we go through. So fixed income investments, what are they? Well, as I mentioned, they're term deposits. Uh, they're also at call accounts. Um, they're bonds, so uh, you'll see they're direct bonds. That's the FIG service where we make, we, we take those $500,000 parcels and we make them available, bonds available in smaller parcels. But bonds can be issued by governments, and in fact the um, Commonwealth Government here is the largest issuer of bonds uh, in Australia. But also corporate bonds, there's quite a lot of um, corporations that issue bonds and some of them will be very well known to you. And the last on the list is the hybrid securities. So hybrids um, are a mix of debt and equity like characteristics. And again, I'll talk you through some of those as, as we move through the, the presentation. But essentially, they're the most complex um, subclass, if you like, in the fixed in income asset class. And uh, most of the prospectuses are quite complex and some of the um, terms and conditions are, are quite complex. Often uh, hybrids are unique in their terms and conditions, so it's really important if you own any of the listed hybrids or even in the wholesale market if you own any, it's worth understanding the risks that you're taking and, and checking the prospectus for them. Okay, so what is a bond? A bond is just a loan from the investor to the company issuing the bond. So when companies get big enough, instead of borrowing money from banks, they can go direct to the market and um, they can borrow from the market. So because they're borrowing and it's a loan, the companies must pay uh, interest to you when they say they're going to and they must pay principal to you when they say they're going to. So that's a key um, characteristic of the asset class is that it's a legal obligation. So they must pay the interest that they set out and they must pay the principal. Now if they don't pay interest and principal, um, there's quite serious consequences for the company and they go into what's known as, as default. Uh, so in essence, um, companies that issue bonds will do just about all that they can to prevent going into default. And I'll talk a bit about that, uh, a bit more about that in a minute. So in essence, the company that's issuing the bond is guaranteeing the bond. So if it's someone like Woolworths, a Woolworths bond, Woolworths guarantee that they will pay you your interest and principal. So if we compare bonds to equities or shares, if you're investing in shares, um, you're buying part of the company, so you're the owner. So you can think of yourself as the owner of that um, company. But the reason you buy shares is so that you will, um, is because you expect them to grow. So you expect that the um, share price will grow and that the dividend will grow. But um, there's no guarantee that either of those things will happen. And in fact, um, there's no consequences as such if a company doesn't pay you a dividend. They can cut dividends uh, and there's no guarantee that your capital will be returned to you at any point. In fact, to get your capital, you have to sell, have to sell your shares. So there's quite different um, characteristics between the two. We like to say that if you're a bond investor, you can think of yourself as the banker, so you're lending your money. Um, and uh, sorry, my mind's just slipped there. Whereas if you're a, a share investor, you're, you're the owner. So if um, you're looking to get into the bond market, the way that um, as an analyst I look at it is looking at the survivability of the company. So what, does, what sort of assets does it have to sell or um, does it have large shareholders that would um, um, but support the company by buying more equity? Um, what sort of uh, equity buffer does it have? And I'll explain that in a, in a, a bit in a, a moment. But so you're looking at what what can the company do to survive? So larger companies are more attractive because they often have more assets that they can sell. Um, and they, they will sell. They'll do other things to, to the detriment of shareholders. For example, um, they'll cut dividends. 
which is actually a, quite a big negative if you're a, a shareholder in a company. But if you're a bondholder, that's very much seen as a positive because the company is retaining funds within, the, within itself to pay the bondholders their interest and principal. So again, it's like the survivability of the company if you're a bond investor versus um, the growth prospects of the company if you're um, a share investor. So a couple of um, bond facts, it's good to um, have a, a better understanding of the market. The global bond market is absolutely huge and roughly five times the size of the global equity market. So much, much larger. Um, we haven't really been uh, so much aware of the, the global bond market here in Australia. I think uh, in a large part for many years we didn't have a government um, uh, debt or bond scheme because the government was in surplus. So we are very much an underdeveloped market here compared to the rest of the world. So the vast majority of the market is traded over the counter and that means that you need to find a broker who will deal in those bonds so that you can access them. Uh, about 95% is over the counter and only about 5% is listed on the ASX. As I mentioned earlier, the biggest um, issuers are the governments and at the end of last year the uh, market was worth approximately $980 billion, the Australian market. Um, with the Commonwealth Government issuing $234 billion, and the semi-governments, which are really the states and the territories, they accounted for about $214 billion in issuance. So a couple of facts about bonds. Some of them are quite long dated, they have quite long terms to maturity, but you don't have to hold to maturity, you can sell prior to maturity, it's one of those um, um, unknown f facts about bonds. So they're generally quite liquid. Um, now because you can sell prior to maturity, there is the opportunity for a capital gain or loss. I'll explain a little bit more about how that works as we go through. Now global best practice suggests that um, superannuation portfolios should contain between 40 to 50% of bonds increasing over time. Now each year the um, OECD does a survey of 29 countries and their pension funds and um, they have found in last year's study that pension, Australian pension funds had an allocation to bonds of roughly 9% whereas the global average of those 29 countries was 53%. So Australia has the lowest allocation to bonds and the highest allocation to shares. Um, so we, we win two prizes there, I'm not sure if they're prizes. But, uh, Anyway, so what we like to say to investors if, is if you have a self-managed super fund that as you age you need to be more protective of your capital so you should increase your weighting to bonds. So we like to say that you should think about owning your age in bonds, that's sort of uh, like a rule of thumb or a, a, a guide if you like. Okay, there's three types of bonds. And I'll just run through each of them because they work differently in different markets and I think that's really important to understand. So the first is a fixed rate bond. Now um, bonds in Australia are typically issued for five years, five year maturity, a senior bond. Um, and we talk about bonds in terms of $100, $100. So even though minimum parcels are much, much bigger than that, we just talk about $100. Um, sizes if you like. So if we have a, a senior bond uh, issued for $100 for five years in Australia and it's paying uh, an interest rate of 6%, <clears throat> we call that interest um, rate a coupon or it's a coupon payment, but if it's paying 6% then as an investor you would know that you would get a $3 payment each half year. So fixed rate bonds pay, three. that particular bond would pay $3 each half year for the five years until the bond matured and then you would get your $100 face value back. But fixed rate bonds are particularly uh, protective bonds. So if you think about when an economy starts to decline, the Reserve Bank then starts to cut interest rates. So if you had a fixed rate bond issued, let's say 10% a few years ago and some of them were issued at 10% and rates have started to come down, Investors in the market will pay more than the $100 face value to get access to that income stream. So um, 
quite a lot of fixed rate bonds in the marketplace now are trading above their hundred dollars. So you would buy them, uh, say 110, you might buy a fixed rate bond at 110 dollars, but you would only ever be repaid the hundred dollars at maturity. But the reason you would actually pay more for it is because it's got that high uh, income stream. So you, you in effect, um, are buying um, that, that income stream. And what we then look at is at the overall yield or the overall return, which is um, always positive. So even if you buy a fixed rate bond, that's what, what is known as a premium, your return, um, if you hold to maturity, will be po positive. Now, if the opposite starts to happen where interest rates rise, fixed rate bond prices will decline. So they will decline and they can go below $100. Um, but you have that comfort that if you hold to maturity, you will get your hundred dollars back. So it's not like you actually, um, not like a dot com bubble, for example, where you might lose your money. You're certain of that hundred dollars back at maturity. So fixed rate bonds, obviously, the best time to buy them is um, when interest rates are high and you're expecting interest rates to move lower. Now at the moment with interest rates being low, we would still advocate an allocation to fixed rate bonds. Might not be as high as what it has been in the past, but um, there is still the possibility of further rate cuts uh, and we are thinking that interest rates will be low for quite a long time. So if you buy a fixed rate bond with a, a high return, you're locking in that income which can give um, investors quite a lot of certainty, particularly those that are nearing retirement or in, in retirement. So let's move on. I can speak about these bonds for a long time. So the second one is a floating rate bond. So just as the name suggests, the, the income you receive on these bonds moves up and down depending on the economic cycle. So over the last few years, the income on the floating rate bonds has moved down. So these haven't been very popular with investors, but uh, now that we're getting close to the bottom of the interest rate cycle, they're gaining popularity. These bonds, um, similarly if we take a senior bond uh, issued for five years, they're linked to a benchmark and the benchmark is the bank bill swap rate. So typically the interest payment is BBSW plus a margin on top of that. It might be BBSW plus um, say 3%. So BBSW at the moment is around 3%. Um, the margin 3% is a sort of a 6% um, interest on, on those bonds. But they're different in that, that um, the interest payment uh, is calculated quarterly uh, in, in, a, in advance. So payments to investors are made quarterly of their income for floating rate bonds. Now the third type of bond is an inflation linked bond and we think these are particularly important because they're the only security with a 100% hedge against inflation. And that's because um, like the floating rate notes, the, um, the interest payment and the capital, the $100, are tied to inflation. So they're tied to the CPI. So the way these bonds work, and I'm, I'll talk just a little bit about the capital index bond. So the way that that works is that uh, the bonds issued for $100 face value uh, at first issue. Now each quarter, if inflation's positive, that $100 increases over time with inflation. So we have um, a Sydney Airport inflation link bond now um, that's worth $125. So that $25 is the inflation component from when the bond was first issued. But what's particularly important is that the um, interest payment is um, set. So the margin set, it might be 4% or 35 or 4.5% over CPI and that's because that margin's paid on that growing face value of the bond. So if we look at Sydney Airport again and you've got $125 face value of the bond, um, the margin of 4% is paid on the $125, not on the $100 at first issue. So it actually accounts for inflation in two ways there. Now the second type of inflation linked bond is called an index annuity bond and these work a little bit like a um, reverse mortgage in that you pay 
um, a lump sum up front and then the issuer pays you back principal and interest over the maturity of the bond. And that base payment, that principal and interest payment is indexed to inflation. So they're uh, particularly attractive, those types of bonds, to people in retirement looking for um, uh, an index or an inflation linked um, income payment. So we had a question early on um, about, about those. Again, I think I'll, I'll leave most of the questions um, towards the end. Uh, but we had a, a question from Richard about some of the issuers there. So Jake and I will talk about those um, towards the end. Okay, so let's move on. One thing before I do move on, I just want to say that um, when you first come um, or are setting up a bond portfolio, I think it's really important to have an allocation to all three types of bonds. The easiest one for, um, for me to recommend it when you start is the inflation linked bonds because um, I'm fairly confident you won't have that 100% uh, linked to inflation protection in your portfolio. So that would be where I would start and then depending on your interest uh, view, you might weight your portfolio to the floating rate or the fixed rate bonds. But there's lots to consider and um, certainly uh, if you come to FIG, um, we would sit down with you and talk about your goals, whether they be risk or return or income or uh, various other, um, other possibilities. We'd talk, to you, talk those through with you and then help you build a portfolio. Okay, so the next page. So what are the benefits of fixed income? Four main benefits. The first is that capital stability that you know at maturity of the bond you will be repaid your hundred dollars. So you know that that capital, you have that capital certainty and you can plan around that. You might have plans uh, to travel or to um, provide for your um, children or grandchildren's education. So that certainty gives um, uh, you know it's hugely beneficial when you you're trying to make plans um, with your portfolio. The second one's that cash flow. So the fixed rate bonds pay half yearly income and the floating rate and the inflation link pay quarterly. So if cash flow and income is important to you, we can help design a portfolio, for example, that has uh, a certain level of income every month. Um, very much um, this uh, buying bonds direct allows you to do that and really tailor a portfolio to what, to what you need or what you need from it. The next one, liquidity. Liquidity in essence is being able to sell something at short notice without loss of value. So if we think about, if you think about um, residential or commercial property, to sell um, quickly either of those, uh, in either of those instances, usually you have to reduce your price. So generally with bonds you don't have to reduce your price to sell, to sell quickly. Even through the um, GFC we found that um, bonds were uh, readily tra tradable. Of course there's different um, levels of risk uh, in bonds and the higher risk bonds sometimes are di more difficult to trade, especially if there are distressed, the market's in a distressed state. So the last one is diversity. So fixed income diversifies away from the growth um, asset classes, if you like, of property and shares. Uh, there's also quite a lot of companies that issue bonds that aren't listed on the ASX. There's some very big um, international companies like uh, General Electric, Swiss Re, AXA, uh, lots of uh, international banks issue Australian dollar bonds as well. I'm talking all about here Australian dollar bonds, so Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, uh, Barclays, BNP Paribas, there's quite a lot of uh, international banks that issue in Australian dollars as well. Which sort of leads me to the next point in terms of diversity because um, by buying bonds in the wholesale market you can access foreign currency bonds. So bonds in yen or Canadian dollars or US dollars or euro or sterling uh, we can source for our clients. So some of our clients uh, have US dollars or uh, euros sitting in accounts earning next to, to nothing. Uh, we can show them foreign currency bonds, again, if they like, issued by Australian companies. 
paying uh, three, four, five percent returns. So that might be of interest to some of you as well. Okay, here's a capital structure diagram and to my way of thinking this is the most important diagram. I think if you can understand how the capital structure works that um, you'll go a long way to understanding the asset class. So what this shows is um, a simplified bank capital structure and it shows the priority of payments in liquidation. So assuming a bank um, is unable to pay all of its obligations and liquidators come in, they start selling down the assets of the bank and the proceeds are applied from the top down. So each level on that ladder, if you like, must be repaid before the next level is, is repaid in a, in a wind up or a liquidation scenario. So if you're sitting at the top uh, in senior secured debt, they're senior secured bonds or covered bonds, you are in the lowest risk position in the capital structure. If you're sitting at the bottom or you're a shareholder or an equity holder, you're in the highest risk position, which means that you should be being paid the highest return. So we call shareholders uh, or equity holders, we say that they're in um, first loss or first loss position, so they take the first losses. So what I'll do is I'll talk through a little bit of um, each of these rungs on the ladder because I think it's important to understand some of the characteristics there. So senior secured bonds, they're covered bonds. Covered bonds were first issued in Australian dollars by Australian banks uh, early last year and uh, these bonds are secured, the banks must set aside 8% of their mortgage loan portfolio into a pool, it's called the covered bond pool. So if you can imagine 8% of their mortgage loan pool is huge, um, they can't lend up to 8%, they can only lend a, a smaller amount of, of the pool. So the pool is what's known as over collateralised, which means there's more security there than um, what they're allowed to borrow. So very low risk. The other thing about that uh, mortgage loan pool is, is if some of the loans in it start to default, the bank's obliged to replenish the pool. So it's not stagnant, it's always going to stay at 8%. So senior secured bonds or covered bonds are very low risk and typically in Australia they're rated AAA. So for example, um, all the banks are, are rated AA minus, but their covered bonds are rated higher than the, the, the bank individual ratings. So coming down the list, the next is term deposits. So term deposits, whilst there is the government guarantee that's um, outside the bank's own capital structure, they're not secured by anything as such and um, you know there's a defined uh, term to maturity and you get your money back. The next level is senior debt, so these are senior bonds, senior unsecured bonds sit at this level and that's um, the issuer, typically the issuer credit rating level. So when I was talking about the four majors being AA minus, we're talking about their senior unsecured debt, so that's this level, senior bonds. So these are the bonds that are issued for five years, generally in Australia, have known interest payment dates and you can expect to be um, repaid at maturity. Low risk, generally very low risk uh, is senior unsecured debt um, and uh, with that certainty um, quite sought after are, are those bonds. So moving down the structure and the terms and conditions now are starting to change on the bonds and um, you're taking on greater risk so again you'd expect to be being paid more. So subordinated debt uh, in essence for banks uh, has a 10 year maturity, so it's a longer term to maturity. But the banks um, recognise that investors don't really want to lend money for 10 years, so they have what's known as a call option. And a call option is the chance for the issuer to redeem the bonds after five years. So a little bit complicated, but um, in essence all the banks have repaid subordinated bonds after five years but there's the chance that the maturity date can be extended for another five years and that's uh, to do with uh, APRA and the regulator, the regulator gets to uh, make that call but um, I think 
the thing to, to remember is that with the extension to maturity, you have that uncertainty as to what will happen with the bank or, or the company is greater uncertainty the longer there is till maturity. So that's the um, uh, subordinated bonds. The uh, interest payments must be made when they say they're going to with subordinated bonds. Now coming down to hybrids, this is the most complex of the fixed income uh, assets and it's very much, um, there's uncertainty in terms of maturity in that you've got some call risk in that the hybrids, the term to maturity can be extended. You also have um, risk that the uh, interest payments may not be paid to you uh, when they say they're going to. So there's clauses in there that allow um, banks to, in essence, forgo making that payment to you. So it's the, the, the interest payments are called non-cumulative, which means um, if they don't make the interest payment to you, they never have to make it up. Now some hybrids have a cumulative um, term, and that means if they miss the interest payments, they must make them up uh, at a later stage. So that's one of the terms that we look for with hybrids, that cumulative or non-cumulative term. Um, also, as you'll appreciate with bank hybrids, that there's the chance um, that they may be converted to shares or equity, given uh, a non-viability or a capital trigger. So there's a couple of uh, other terms in there that are worth investigating, but essentially if you own a bank hybrid and the bank gets into trouble, APRA can make a non-viable call, so they think the bank is non-viable. What happens to those hybrids then is that they convert to shares. Now this hasn't been tested and APRA don't give us uh, much to go on in terms of you know, what a non-viable bank looks like. So very difficult to uh, try and analyse, but you can appreciate if APRA make that call about a bank, the share price will be falling rapidly. So not good for hybrid investors in terms of that conversion can really work against them and they can lose uh, quite a lot, if not all of their money if the bank's in serious trouble. So hybrids very much, um, whilst the rates can look attractive, you, in essence I think are taking on a lot of that equity downside risk, which you might be quite happy to, to take on, but you don't get any of the upside with the growing share price or the growing uh, a dividend. So as an analyst um, looking at this, um, what do I look for? The first thing I look for is I assess um, all the different um, types of investments throughout the capital structure. So I'm assessing what I'm looking for is the best return given the risk involved. So it's not just the return because if I was looking at just return, I would always want to invest in the shares. So last year when the covered bonds um, were first issued, Commonwealth Bank issued a covered bond and it, it was a floating uh, uh, bond and it was issued at the bank bill swap rate plus 175 basis points. Now when that was issued, that was by far the best relative value in the Commonwealth Bank's capital structure because um, it was the first time a covered bond had been an, issued by an Australian bank in Australian dollars and they were paying more so that it would be successful. So had you bought those covered bonds there uh, then, um, you would have made a capital gain. I think the price on the bond is trading at 103 or 104 dollars, and that spread or that margin of 175 basis points has come into something like 50 basis points now. So, just to give you an example of um, relative value, uh, I'm, and I'm hoping that you understand um, understand that. I'm getting quite a few questions in, which is great. Um, but again, I think I'll try and leave them till towards the end and we'll cover them towards the end. So we'll go to the next page now. Okay, so what, what this graph shows, it's a snapshot of uh, the worst possible time in the market. So it incorporates the GFC. Uh, and I wanted to take that look really to show you um, the volatility between the different types of securities in that capital structure. So what we do is we assume a $100 investment in three Commonwealth Bank securities. Uh, the first is a senior debt uh, and that's the dark blue line at the top. 
Now if you remember I said that they only um, uh, generally lasted for five years. So because it's a longer term than that, we assume that one bond uh, matures and we reinvest the whole amount in another um, Commonwealth Bank senior, senior bond. So you can see, also I should mention, we add back the um, uh, interest payments on the bonds and we add back the dividends on the shares but we don't include franking because not everyone can access that. So if you included franking, that, that line would be different for, for the shares. So let's just have a look at this. The, the navy blue line is the, um, is the senior bond. You can see it's gently upward sloping, doesn't move around uh, very much. Um, it was what we deemed as a flight to quality asset during the GFC, so people did seek to buy the senior bond. They um, sold out of the shares and the hybrids and, and bought senior bond for, for safety. The next line, the sort of the mid blue point line is the hybrid, that's the Pearl 3. And assuming you invested that $100 in December 07, uh, if you were a four seller in about March 09, you would have lost about 70% of your initial investment. But you can see since then uh, they've improved, the outlook's improved and been a little bit of volatility, but they've generally um, um, seen, their, seen their way up to the $100 mark and over again. Uh, the third line again is the, uh, share, the shares. The worst possible time uh, for the shares was uh, about January 2009, uh, that whole period early 2009, where you could have lost over 50% of your initial investment had you been a forced seller at that point. But you can see from there the shares have uh, increased in value and um, were steady throughout 2011 and about mid last year started to take off and the share value has um, surpassed the, the bond value. Well, interestingly the hybrid still is lower than the, the share value. So just wanting to show the types of volatility you can expect across those um, levels in the capital structure and um, the certainty that the bonds provide certainly uh, worthwhile thinking about in terms of your own portfolios. Okay, this next slide is, um, it compares the S&P um, ASX 200 accumulation index, which is just um, the top 200 stocks with uh, dividends um, added back, versus the UBS composite bond index. So the composite bond index uh, is made up of roughly 70% government bonds and about 30% of corporate bonds. Again, it adds back um, the income on, on those bonds. So the um, S&P 200 accumulation index is the blue line. Um, if you look at that, it's fairly upward sloping and then it um, starts to peak uh, in September 07. Then it's got a, a sharp fall, it's risen again, uh, come down a little bit, up and down and, uh, and up. So it's again just showing that it's um, quite a lot more volatile than uh, bonds generally. The bonds are, have been general, generally upward sloping but uh, not too much volatility. Now whilst the end of the graph shows September 12, it's actually about May 13. Um, we just don't show it because it's run in September, uh, annual um, years to September. Um, but this is over a longer period. So this is from September 89 and it really shows over that period that the UBS composite bond outperformed um, the S&P ASX 200 accumulation index, which going back to that capital structure diagram you wouldn't actually uh, expect. I should say since then uh, the shares have definitely outperformed the bonds and, and it does sit higher, which is what we again, what we would uh, expect. So what are the main risks? There's five main risks uh, with bonds. The first is the uh, credit and that's just um, that the company who's issued the bond can't pay you principal and interest when they say they're going to. Uh, so that's the biggest one. We certainly do our research here and um, we look at that, that risk and um, generally the measures that we think mitigate that risk. 
Second one's liquidity, which we've talked about, uh, ability to sell your investments at short notice without loss of value. Generally, bonds are, are liquid. If we go back to that capital structure diagram, the hybrids are less liquid, for example, than the um, senior bonds in the one company. So you ex expect a, a greater liquidity in distress markets of, of the lower risk bonds. Inflation. Inflation is a very important one and one where I think uh, Australian market's been a little bit complacent with uh, in terms of we've had a, a lovely low steady rate of inflation for quite a long time but there are a few indicators that uh, inflation may take off. Just the amount of uh, liquidity out there in the market or the quantitative easing, certainly a lot of um, global market watchers are very nervous about inflation and we'd certainly suggest some inflation protection uh, in your portfolio. Interest rates mainly impacts fixed rate bond prices. Uh, the floating rate notes are more capital stable as such so they don't move around in, uh, as much as the uh, fixed rate bond prices. The great thing about bonds is that you, unless the company defaults, you will get your $100 back um, or more if they're inflation linked bonds at maturity. And the last risk is the call risk. So that is uh, the chance that the maturity date will be extended on, on the subordinated bonds or the hybrids that you own. So uh, of course with the longer term to maturity there's, there's greater uncertainty. So that really completes the first part of the presentation uh, and I'd now like to hand you over to Jake Conduction who is sitting right next to me in the Brisbane office today and he's going to talk you through um, some por portfolios. So thanks very much, Jake. Thanks, Liz. Thanks to everyone for joining us. Um, as, as Liz mentioned, I work um, on the sales desk here in uh, Brisbane. Uh, I've been in the markets for about 20 years now, both on the trading side for about half my career and uh, portfolio management side for about half my career as well. Now I, I simply concentrate on the, the credit side and, and, and the bond side. So um, let's go through the real world example here. And there's, I'll try to touch on some of the questions, but I, I guess we will also keep the uh, webinar going uh, for time constraints, but um, let's get into it. This is a retail portfolio targeting 5.5%. Um, we actually do hit the target and then some at 5.85% for the overall portfolio. Um, it's got a cash yield, although you can't see it there, I've, I've printed out the portfolio for myself here cash yield of 4.24%, so uh, that's a running yield, so that, that, that's how much cash and cash return you can expect to be paid on the portfolio. Um, it has an average term, not including that Sydney airport, of about 4.7 years, so uh, quite digestible. And uh, I guess it's got a good mix of fixed, floating, and inflation-linked assets within the portfolio. So, uh, And of note, uh, all these positions are available in $10,000 increments. So uh, we touched on our earlier, originally bonds uh, several years back were available in minimum $500,000. Uh, we've reduced that down to $10,000 for a large number of them and $50,000 and $100,000 increments. But all these ones on this portfolio are actually available down to $10,000 increments. So. Uh, so let's go through the names here. Sydney Airport, if anybody's ever flown into Australia, which I have a number of times. Um, it's a monopoly infrastructure asset, of course, the Sydney Airport, um, so Australia's largest international and domestic hub. This specific bond is a senior inflation-linked bond, um, offering quite a nice attractive return at 7.2%. Uh, recently, they've done some refinancing, actually, I think it was last, uh, last year, not that long ago, though. They have a great willingness and ability to refinance their, their operations, so people are willing to lend to them quite quite freely. Uh, and they have a very diverse revenue base coming from parking, the aer aeronautical uh, part of their business, of course, and the retail operations. So quite an attractive, safe asset, uh, inflation and senior bond. Moving on to the South Bank Institute of Technology, there was a number of questions earlier about uh, annuities and uh, this specific bond that we're looking at, the South Bank Institute of Technology, is a public-private partnership. And that's between the Queensland government and a consortium that built and is now maintaining that South Bank TAFE educational um, asset here just across the river from where we are here at FIG in Brisbane. 
Um, so the construction is now complete, and it's now into the lower maintenance, uh, fa uh, lower risk maintenance phase of the of the asset. So again, a very solid senior bond offering 5.3% uh, return. This is a specifically a fixed paid bond and quite attractive. Um, Touching on that annuity, a lot of annuities, there was a question from Richard earlier about annuity bonds and the risk. A lot of the annuity bonds we offer are uh, from these public-private partnerships, and we can get into further details later on. Let's keep on track here with that Dalrymple Bay Coal Terminal Bond. This is, a sen again, a senior debt, so very, very safe. Uh, that's the world's largest, uh, third largest coal terminal. They're running about 85 million tons of capacity, and uh, that's about 20% of the world's metallurg metallurgical coal. Uh, it's a very regulated infrastructure asset. There's no volume risk for them. They have take-or-pay contracts with uh, Rio, BHP, Extrata, Peabody, MacArthur Coal. So you can imagine quite a solid asset to, to own overall. And that last company there, Vero, more commonly known, I guess, uh, as Suncorp, um, this is a subordinated bond. Every other asset in the portfolio is a uh, senior position. This Vero position is, is a subordinate bond, but again, still very, very solid. Very uh, diverse wealth management, banking, and of course, insurance uh, company here in Australia. Uh, the largest underwriter of general insurance and the second largest in New Zealand. So, again, a very attractive portfolio overall. Uh, about four, 4.7 years, excluding that Sydney Airport uh, inflation linked bond. Um, and certainly offers a very attractive risk reward trade off and uh, touching on what you you mentioned earlier Liz um, on the credit side in bond world you think risk first then return we're always worried about uh, safety first and then return so a very very safe solid portfolio to consider so maybe we'll move on to the next page and this is a uh, 6% target portfolio, and some of these offerings are, are for wholesale only. We should probably touch on that later on. There's been a, there's been a question or, or so on that uh, in some of the questions uh, that we've seen come across our desk here. Um, so in this, this portfolio, we're targeting 6%, and again, we, we, we hit it quite handily at a 6.29% return. Again, it's got a good mix of senior uh, senior positions. That's that's about 60% of this portfolio is in senior debt. So that's the top of the capital structure uh, for for these companies involved. So very very safe positions. And um, I guess there's a good uh, good return of what 6.29%. The running yield on this is quite high. It's kicking out a very high cash flow. Um, about 6.4% cash flow yield on this one, and the average term is about five years for this overall portfolio. Again, a good um, there's a mix uh, of fixed and floating in this portfolio, but but here at Fig we can design the portfolio for whatever you whatever you'd like. If you're looking for higher cash flow, or if you think that interest rates are going to rise, we can aim the portfolio more to that that uh, that view as well. But sticking back to this this. This portfolio start off with cash converters. This is a, one of Fig's originated bonds. We've, we're proud to have uh, originated a number of bonds over the last uh, year or so. Uh, Silver Chef, um, uh, Mackay Sugar, cash converters, G8 Education, uh, PMP, and and now we're just uh, um, just just doing one for Pace Limited, a very attractive nine and a half percent bond for five years. Uh, sticking to this cash converters though. Um, it's ASX listed uh, personal loan specialist is a senior 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 debt for this company. Um, they also handle second uh, secondhand goods, of course. It formed about 30 years ago, and it's now um, now about 80 percent of its revenues are divide, uh, derived from lending, uh, which is a very key area of growth for the company. It's of course one of Australia's best known retail brands, and um, uh, our note, analysts note that cash converters is characterized by uh, robust cash flows, very low gearing, and strong coverage ratios. Very, very high interest coverage ratios for this for this asset. And and five-year bond offering 7.64 percent per annum return. Very attractive. Dalrymple Bay Coal Terminal this is the same asset we had in the the prior portfolio. Um, and and again, the cash converter is actually available in $10,000 increments. So is this Dalrymple Bay Coal Terminal uh, that we see there. Again, a senior uh, senior asset. Uh, Swiss Re. This is a hybrid in the portfolio. Very very strong credit uh, overall. Uh, this is an Aussie dollar issued um, tier one. So and it, it's one of the older style, uh, less onerous hybrids that, that are existing in in the marketplace right now. Swiss Re itself is a global reinsurance company. It's uh, second biggest behind 
behind Munich Re. I, I personally think that they're going to take out Munich Re in the next coming years, but we'll see how they go. They're doing extremely well from a credit uh, standpoint. Uh, earnings keep on coming out. I, nothing. Nothing short of spectacular, in my opinion. Um, they received a several uh, an upgrade not that long ago as well. So very strong balance sheet, improving revenues, um, and in, in my view, also quite an attractive risk reward trade trade off. And touching on the last bond, Qantas. This is the senior uh, senior credit here for Qantas, so the senior side of, of the company. Um, it's founded in 1920. And it's of course one of um, Australia's largest domestic and international airline. Uh, it's got a dominant position, including their 65 percent. Um, uh, probably they have 65 percent of the market, including their their Jetstar holdings. Uh, Three billion in cash and about 400 million in, in, in available liquidity right now. So. Quite a safe, solid overall portfolio, uh, overall credit here. Pardon me. Uh, again, coming back to this portfolio, that's that's about 60% senior credit, uh, and a very, very attractive risk reward trade-off, showing you about a 6.3% return and a good mix between fixed and floating positions. And a lot of those positions in that portfolio are available then down to $10,000 increments. Jake, I think we'll just take a couple of questions now. That fixed, uh, sorry, retail versus wholesale um, category for clients. Basically, all investors are considered retail investors unless they can prove they're wholesale investors. So if you can prove you're wholesale investors, you need to be able to show that you have net assets of $2.5 million or um, have your accountant sign off to say that you've earned $250,000 gross for the last two consecutive years. So they're the sort of the hurdles that you need to jump. Um, what generally the difference is um, that uh, you don't have to, or we don't have to just um, have the same sorts of disclosures to wholesale clients. So a lot of companies when they issue bonds only want them um, and make comments in their prospectuses that they can only be sold to wholesale investors. So it's not uh, FIG's determination if you like, it's the determination of the prospectus that um, allows us uh, to sell bonds to retail or wholesale clients. But very generally there's a, a lot more bonds available to wholesale investors and as you can see from the last two slides you can generally earn higher, higher returns. Um, now one of the other questions was um, one of the other, oh, where is it? Um, Kevin asked, why not have all Sydney Airport for the previous retail slide? So Kevin, um, very important we think to um, make sure you have a diversified portfolio. So if you remember just talking about the three types of bonds, the fixed, which are best when interest rates are coming down, and if you want to be sure, certain of your income, or the floating rate bonds when you think interest rates might be starting to rise, uh, and the inflation ones for that inflation protection. So the bonds all have different um, uh, protections, if you like, and that's why we would say have a diversity of, of fixed and floating and term to maturity and risk in your portfolio. So I'm hoping uh, that helps. And um, while we're on this slide, Jake, Graham has asked us what spread applies to the small cap bonds, say Silver Chef and cash converters. Would you like to answer that one? Yeah, sure, of course. Um, this is a live marketplace and people are bidding and there's offer prices and of course uh, FIG is a commercial company and we need to stay in business. So um, typically the bond market around the world makes money by taking little bits off the bid or the offer. So uh, I guess for example, um, the question is relating to some of our FIG originated bonds and they're, they're, they're just like any other bonds out there. People have bids and there's offers and um, I guess with Silver Chef, uh, current offer level, let's bring up my pricing sheet here. Um, I think it's about 106.10, so that's a very high coupon bond. It was issued about a year ago. Uh, it's got an 8.5% coupon, and of course, Silver Chef, a very strong, uh, strong company. Uh, offer price at 106.10, I believe it's bidding at 105.10. So just as an example of how bond market around the world makes money, we'll, we'll, we'll source that bond at call it 105.75 or 105.80 and we'll sell it to investors at 106.10. And same thing uh, with the bid side at say 105.10, actually I think that is where it is, but um, we'll get it filled at 105.20 and you get filled at 105.10. So the bond market around the world, including FIG of course, uh, there's little bits taken off the bid or the offer and that's the only way that we, we make our 
or pound of flesh, if you will. Um, there's no no annual fees, no no fees to maintain your account. So it's just simply have to bid ask uh, offer there. Uh, same same idea with cash converters. I think it actually it's a little bit tighter on the cash converters um, on the bid offer spread. Uh, I think the current offer price on cash converters is 101.20. So that's the offer price. If you buy it at that price, you're yielding 7.64%. Uh, I think it's bidding at par 60, somewhere in that range. So a little bit tighter between the bid and the offer on that right now. Generally speaking, the longer term the bond, the wider the dollar spread between the bid and the offer. So a bond that's got, say, a year to go um, before they call it in or it matures will have 25, 30, 40 cents between the bid and the offer. Uh, but a 30-year, but a 40-year bond could have two, three dollars between the bid and the offer. So um, I hope that, that covers the... Thanks, Jack. No, that's good. We've got a, a couple of questions from John. Um, he's really talking about some of the um, how the bonds work as such. So he said, when you buy a bond, what does it mean by accrued interest? So I think that's a really good question, John. So when you buy a bond, you need to pay the seller of that bond the interest that's accrued up until the date that you buy it. So, um, so what happens is you pay them the interest. Say it's midway through the point where you're going to get your next interest payment. You would pay them half the interest um, on the bond and then when the next um, interest payment is made, you get the full interest for the quarter. So you just pay up front the interest they're entitled to uh, and then you get that back um, on the next uh, interest payment date. So John's also asked if um, a bond is buying or selling at a premium, what's the ideal time to sell before maturity? So uh, very much depends um, on, on the income stream, we normally say about 18 months to 12 months out, have a look um, uh, at selling that bond. Um, in essence, you're going to be paid, only be paid your $100 at maturity and from about there on in, that bond price will move back towards that $100. So just keep a close eye on any of the bonds you buy um, or you might pay a premium for the fixed rate ones. So John's also asked again about fixed rate bonds. Um, the liquidity of uh, fixed interest bonds when interest rates start rising it very much depends on the perception of the market. So a lot um, goes to people's um, expectations, not actual numbers. So um, we saw that earlier in the year with Bernanke saying he was going to uh, taper quantitative easing. It didn't happen and all the yields on the, the US Treasury started to rise. So very much depends on how how um, much um, investors think interest rates will rise and, and how quickly. So if we get a real spike in interest rates, which um, we don't think is going to happen, but if you did, you would expect the prices to um, come off uh, fairly quickly. The government bonds uh, will come off more quickly if it's to do with uh, quantitative easing and tapering than the corporate bonds. They'll be slower, but the, the prices will still come off. I think you very much have that comfort that um, you know you hold to maturity. If you were worried about that and you were looking to add fixed rate bonds to your portfolio, you probably wouldn't add the much longer dated ones. So you, you know you might look out to three or five years. You you might not want to um, buy bonds out to fixed rate bonds out to ten years or or even twenty years as the most recent Commonwealth government bond uh, was issued just last week for twenty years uh, at about. I think it was about 4.6 or 4.8% somewhere around there. So you wouldn't be a, a buyer of a 20-year fixed rate bond. So I'm hoping uh, that helps. Now we have a couple of questions um, on inflation-linked bonds. So um, Bruce has asked, what's the impact of deflation on inflation-linked bonds and floating rate notes? And is there a flaw underneath the coupon rate to protect holders' income in the event of deflation? Um, Jack, do you want to answer that one? Yeah, of course. A great question as well. Um, look, these are linked to inflation one for one, and, and as rare as um, uh, 
rare as it is that deflation actually occurs, it's within the realm of possibility. It's uh, extremely unlikely, but again, within the realm of possibility, we, we concern ourselves with risk, and that's what we assess on a daily basis, especially the credit team here. Uh, they assess, are we being compensated for the risk we take? What are the risks available out there? And there's plenty of things to worry about, and that's, that's what we do. That's why we, uh, that's what we do day in, day out, is worry for you folks. Um, but deflation, if deflation occurs, there is a floor in place for the Sydney Airport lines. Uh, it can go all the way back down to a hundred dollar base level. Now the Sydney Airport 20s are trading a well, circa 125 somewhere in that range and that's been because there's been a number of years inflation has been positive. Uh, the Sydney Airport 30s interesting enough are trading around that hundred dollar level even though the face value is circa 120 so if you really are concerned that it will hit a deflationary spiral and if that does occur um, the floor value is hundred and if we do indeed hit a long-term deflationary spiral, um, typically interest rates will be at zero, so you're currently at our two and a half percent with the RBA, but interest rates will be down to zero, and you're still getting a fixed percentage on the Sydney 30s uh, of 3.12 and the Sydney 20s of 3.76, so you'll still be getting a 3.76 return while everyone else is probably earning very, very small amounts. Um, no one knows what the future brings, and this touches on why you know, we include fixed floating and inflation linked bonds. I'm sure there's many, many folks in, in Japan that thought that interest rates would eventually head back up, but here they are several years, uh, or 20 or so years down the road, and still extremely low interest rates. No one knows what the future brings. That's why building a portfolio with inflation linked, uh, fixed pay and floating with pay is a very, very good idea. Um, Interesting also, the annuity bonds, the inflation linked annuity bonds, uh, many of them their cash flow stream ratchets up with inflation, but it stays stagnant if deflationary uh, pressures occur. Uh, so again, very, very rare to have deflationary um, periods. I think in the last 20 years there might have been two quarters where it has occurred, but, but again, you know, it is within the realm of possibility, hence building a diversified portfolio. If deflation occurs, your fixed part of your portfolio will perform uh, outstanding. So hope that covers the question. Thanks. Thanks, Jack. That does. Um, John's had another question about ILBs, and he's saying, how do you realise the inflation on the capital index bonds? Well, the inflation, um, it, in part you realise it through the uh, income, so the income you get quarterly, but in terms of that building um, face value of the bond, uh, the only way to realise it is to wait for maturity or to sell down um, some of the bonds as you go along. So if you, say, bought $100,000 of Sydney Airport um, 2020 or 2030, what you could do um, is with the smaller bond parcels that we now make available in $10,000 lots, you could choose to sell down a $10,000 um, part or portion of that bond you know, each year over 10 years. So that, as an example, that might be another way that you can access um, uh, those, those bonds. So I'm just looking through the list here of the questions. Please um, keep them coming in. We're happy to uh, keep answering them. Um, Julio has asked about the running yield on the Sydney Airport bond, the 2030. Jake, do you have any idea? It's around about four. It might be just over, just under. I think the, the 30s are four and a half, but I'll let you answer, Jake. Yeah, the, the Sydney Airport uh, 30s are yield, the running yield, so the cash and cash returns 3.83%, and the Sydney 20s is 3.93%, so just under the 4% range for, for the running yield portion, so it kicks out not only a nice um, nice overall return, uh, but also get, paying you a nice cash flow along the way. So, And then, of course, your cash flow increases uh, as the longer you hold it, assuming a positive inflation number keep continuing out there. And we're, we're running at circa 2.2, 2.3 right now in Australia. So I uh, expect that cash will continue upwards as time goes on, unless, again, we hit a major deflationary spiral. Um, but then the, the fixed part of your portfolio will compensate for that. So. Okay, great. That's great, Jake. Thanks very much. We might move on with the presentation. There's still a few questions um, there, but we'll answer them um, towards the end as we're getting close to the end of the presentation now. So. Um, this next page is an interesting one. I think most of you will be keen to uh, have a look at it, and Jake will talk you through it.
Uh, thanks, Liz. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this is, I guess, just a cross-section of some of the offerings we have, and it's a very, very wide universe of, of bonds out there. Liz touched on earlier that uh, diversification, and again, world best practice is well, what I used to use as a portfolio manager was whatever the age uh, of the investor was, that's the allocation towards the safety camp. And again, that's, that's cash, term deposits, and bonds, where, where, where FIG makes its ex expertise in. Um, diversification across companies. Uh, there's also a foreign currency bonds that, are, that we have available in Aussie dollar, British pound, US dollar, euro, uh, yen. So lots of choice out there. This is a wide universe. These are some of the choices that, and, and bonds that we offer. SockGen and BNP, I just want to say that Liz made a very great call a number of years back two or three years ago on these if uh, offerings saying that just offering great, great returns and they've rallied dramatically since and now the offerings aren't quite as attractive and I'm more than happy to lighten up on these positions. Um, but SockGen, Stockland, BNP, Mervac, Westpac, Telstra, Rabobank, um, Morgan Stanley, NAB Bank, these, these are everyday companies that, that we see in there are going to likely exist uh, in the coming years. And, Again, that comes down to uh, the, really the crux of fixed income versus, I guess, equities. Is will these companies survive to pay us our interest in principal payments? And our dedicated and excellent research team, uh, which Liz is a big part of, of course, uh, help us make sure that these companies uh, are going to exist and, and are going to be there to pay us our interest in principal. So a very, very wide cross-section of offerings available to, to investors. And this is just literally just a, a small sample of the, the companies I, I deal in, about 200 to 250. And dealers like myself across the country are here to, to help you wade through, try to find you the best, uh, the highest safety for the best return. And, and we, we spend all our time doing that. Uh, to find the best offerings for you. Um, so yeah, quite a wide universe. Thanks, Jack. I've got a few more questions um, that we'll run through, I think. The first is from Richard, and he's asking if there's a bond calculator on the web somewhere where you can work out the yield to maturity. Uh, there isn't, Richard. It's quite a complicated uh, calculation. We have um, the Reserve uh, Bank, the RBA, does have some um, ways does show you how to calculate yield to maturity on its website uh, and we've reproduced that in um, the Australian Guide to Fixed Income, our, the book that we published in July this year as well as uh, some other facts. If you haven't got a copy of that guidebook please let us know and we can send you one either electronically or in hard form. Um, a couple of other questions, John has asked about the rating system for bonds. Uh, most um, bonds that we deal with, John, are rated by the credit rating agencies Standard & Poor's, uh, Moody's or Fitch, and most of them are rated investment grade, so that means triple B minus or above. Um, now the, the new issues that we've done, the origination deals that we've done where we've um, um, raised funds for uh, those uh, six companies, they're not rated. So there are bonds out there that are not rated as well. Uh, typically, for uh, not rated, you would expect to have a higher return uh, for those bonds, although we would always cover, um, uh, discuss the, the, the company and the bond in a research report. So you would do your own research and read our research and then uh, make a decision on whether that was uh, going to be right for you or not. Um, we have a, a question here from uh, Torsten who is asking, in a rising interest rate environment, um, it would seem there's little incentive to consider uh, a bond purchase except uh, for floaters. Um, not necessarily, very much dependent on your view, Torsten, of how much further rates were going to go or if, for example, in that environment <coughs> um, when people typically start to sell down fixed rate bonds, the prices would we would expect would fall below $100. So you would get a greater return at maturity, so you would get some additional capital gain at maturity. So there's quite a lot to weigh up uh, and certainly not everyone thinks the same about interest rates um, or times to buy and sell. Most uh, investors, especially the larger, more sophisticated investors, would always hold all three types of bonds. Uh, they would just have a weighting or a preference to one uh, over and above the others. The um, inflation linked bonds, for example, um, you know, if you think uh, that interest rates are rising, that's because the Reserve Bank is trying to slow growth, they're trying to slow it down a little bit. Uh, they're 
under the, that sort of scenario, that's when there is a chance for that inflation spiral. So if you remember, I'm not sure if you were here in Australia uh, in the 80s, but we had about four years, uh, consecutive years where inflation was over 10% per annum. And I think the, it, it maxed out in March, oh, I can't remember which year it was, it might have been 79, I don't quote me on that one, but it maxed out at about 17.6%. So for those inflation linked bonds, if you're looking at a margin of 4% over inflation, uh, that particular quarter you would have had a 21% return. So that's where um, as well with inflation that would really erode any um, retirement savings you had and your purchasing power. So very much we think our inflation linked bonds are fairly important to start um, consider holding at this point because while we haven't had a, an outburst, the sort of the conditions uh, are looking like that we could be moving towards one in future years. And again, just for that inflation uh, protection. So David's asked about what effect does our US Treasury prices yields have on the Australian environment. Um, again, we've seen that with that um, talk about quantitative easing, that it certainly did affect particularly government bond uh, yields. Government bond yields rose, which meant the government bond prices came down when uh, Bernanke was talking about that tapering. It did also impact fixed rate bonds at that time, uh, not quite to the same extent as the government bonds. So it will, it will impact our market. Um, I think, to my mind, they were testing the water then. And I think they'll uh, be very slow uh, to taper and they'll have to do it very carefully because uh, they don't want to upset um, growth prospects or um, have an increase in unemployment again in the US. So they'll be, I think it'll be gentle and it'll be over quite a long term. I don't expect to see any uh, radical um, tapering, especially now with Yellen at the helm. I think it'll be quite a, a, slow, a slow process. Um, just looking through uh, some of the questions. Bruce has asked if there's a good uh, book or a foundation on bonds uh, for an investor experienced in equity. I think the one that um, Fig's written, Bruce, would be perfect for you. So we'll certainly, um, if you send us in your address, if we don't already have it, we'll, we would love to send you a hard copy. The other um, book that I use uh, and is sort of the, the global um, if you like, um, expert is a man called Frank Fabozzi, F-A-B-O-Z-Z-I, uh, and his handbook of uh, fixed income securities is available on Amazon. It's about $100, I think, and it's about 800 pages, so um, a good holiday read, uh, perhaps a, a better read if you're having trouble sleeping at night, <laughs> but certainly uh, you, you'll learn a lot if you um, picked up that book. Um, just running through a couple more here. Um, uh, I think I'm getting close to covering them. There was one very early on that I wanted to go back to um, from, from uh, David. David has asked, for a 76-year-old, how much more important is a short maturity date than an early first call date? That's a great question, uh, David, not one I've had before. And I might ask Jake to, um, to, to cover that and then I can have a quick sip of water um, before we finalise the, uh, the presentation. Thanks, Jake. Thanks, Liz. Um, let's Look, a bond is just a payment stream to you. So, I mean, it's you, con uh, David, you concentrate on, on living forever, and I'll concentrate on paying you safely. So, uh, you could certainly buy a, a one year bond or a two year bond, or you can buy a five year bond. Uh, there's certainly quite a few uh, attractive offerings out there. Um, as far as call dates are concerned, um, it's very, very, very uncommon for bonds not to be redeemed on their call date. It's a big bond market no-no, it tend to, uh, tends to send a, a signal that something might be wrong with the company. So, And the, the bond market is very uh, in tune with the call date and when it's to be expected and in tune with the credit quality. So if there was any concern that, say, Suncorp or Bureau was not going to call some of the bonds in, in uh, 2014 or 15, the market would probably be start pricing in quite early. So 
Number one, I would rely on the call date uh, as the most likely period when you will get paid back your money. Legally, the cubbies can extend, but uh, it's very uncommon for that to occur, uh, especially in the Australian experience. Um, I don't think I've ever there has ever been a major that hasn't um, called in Australia, but um, it'd be very difficult for me to drum up a name just off the top of my head. Um, as far as short maturity, what is short maturity? You're, you're 76 years old. You probably got another 40 or 50 years in you. So. Uh, by all means, you could you could certainly uh, pick up a two, three, four year bond if that's short enough for you, or if that's not short enough for you. There certainly are uh, what were ten year bonds that have been around for say eight years and only two years remaining. Remember, these are very liquid investments that get bought and sold from uh, hundreds of investors uh, every day. So uh, again, if you had a ten year bond that the eight years have matured, uh, have passed by, pardon me and there's only two years remaining, is that short enough for you? So the question is, how long do you want? There are bonds, there's a Rabobank bond offer for one year, and there are other short-term maturities available for you. So hopefully that covers the question, hopefully. Thanks, Jake. We'll just go to um, finish the last couple of pages of how can um, you access the bond universe. Uh, you need to find a broker for the vast majority of bonds available. Um, FIG is a broker. Um, we have as I mentioned earlier, identified bonds which can be owned and traded in smaller parcels from $10,000 face value, minimum $50,000 in total. Uh, we provide a free custodial service. As uh, Jake mentioned, our brokerage um, is, and that's how we get paid, it's a bit like um, foreign currency or foreign exchange market where you see a, a buy and a sell spread, or a bit, um, and that's the same here. But the rate that we show investors, if we showed you 5.6% on a bond, that would be the rate uh, that you would earn. Now that brokerage um, pays for uh, research, and communication, of course, also us um, making sure that you get all your uh, interest payments and any notifications from the issuers of the bonds. And of course, we have uh, help with selecting bonds and constructing portfolios. So we um, recognise that most people don't understand um, a lot about the market, so we've really um, tried to produce as much information as we can to help you understand. So the first one up there is the Australian Guide to Fixed Income. This is uh, nearly 300 pages, this book, and uh, I call it my baby this year because it took me nine months to, to uh, help produce. I'm the editor. There's a number of other uh, experts from FIG that helped uh, write and edit the guide, but uh, it's purely on the Australian market doesn't, uh, it's educational, it's not selling uh, anything uh, specifically as such. Um, it has an introduction from Ian McFarlane who was a former governor of the Reserve Bank and is, also has a tax, uh, a tax chapter from PricewaterhouseCoopers and I think probably the most valuable part is uh, the glossary at the back but if you'd like an electronic or a hard copy uh, please let us know. We also have uh, written a professional online course that um, was targeting um, planners and advisors and it's been certified by the Financial Planning Association and worth five and a half um, continuing professional development points. So if you're looking at learning a bit more about the market, that's a bit more technical than the guidebook, uh, you might be, worth, um, might be worth finding out a bit more about that. We have a weekly newsletter called The Wire. Um, Again, that comes out on a Wednesday morning. We just try and keep you up to date with what's happening in the market. does cover uh, research uh, reports that we write and um, our opinions about different bonds and different uh, issuers. We also have some little essentials guides, um, just going over what we've talked about today. You can find those on the website and download them if you like. Uh, and there are some educational videos, again, on our website and uh, myself and I think three or four of my colleagues, we talk through some of the, uh, the facts. You can also, uh, I'm pretty sure, download a copy of maybe not this webinar, but um, uh, another webinar in case you want to um, uh, hear it again. But uh, that concludes the main body uh, part of the um, presentation. And if you have any questions, any further questions, please send them through to us. There are a couple here that um, I'll go through. John asked about what are the costs associated with buying the bonds. 
So John, there's no uh, management fees and no ongoing fees. It's a direct market. So you're buying direct into the wholesale market and you just um, would pay that brokerage fee, which is between the buy-sell spread uh, to, to FIG. And as I mentioned, the, the rate we show is the rate that you would receive on the, on the bonds. Uh, I don't think I've got any, we've got any other questions, Jack. I think we've pretty well answered them. So just uh, in conclusion, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, whilst if we've missed any questions or you think of any others, please email us uh, and we're happy to, only too happy to answer them. Um, we do think that bonds are really important uh, to every investor's uh, portfolio. Uh, because of the stability and the certainty they, they provide, that capital stability, that known repayment on a specific date uh, and the income that you can earn either quarterly or half yearly. Um, certainly our models, if we uh, build you a portfolio, we can show exactly what income you can expect and, and when, um, provide fantastic stability uh, to your portfolio. So in conclusion, again, I just want to thank you all for joining us. Um, uh, and please, we're here to help. If you have any other questions, uh, please call. But thanks again and uh, good afternoon. This now concludes the presentation.